Now, a fifth gear team test. Our chance to get a quick first look and first impression of a brand new car. And this week, we've got a special guest in snooker ace and self-confessed petrol head, Ronnie O'Sullivan. So this time, the team tested the DS Crossback 7. With prices starting at £28,000, the Crossback is aimed squarely at the premium SUV sector to take on the likes of Range Rover Evoque, Audi Q5 and Jaguar E-Pace. There's a range of petrol and diesel engines and this version we're looking at is the Prestige PT225 with a price tag of nearly 40 grand. How nice is this? I like it. I really got excited by it. This is the C C I was going to say Citroen, but no, it's no, not. No, no, no. It's, it's the, the DS7 DS Crossback. Yeah. Where's a Citroen? It's not. And who makes DSs? It's Citroen. Citroen. Right. Yeah. It's a Citroen to me. I mean, this grill, I mean, all of me. Do you not like that? I love the grill. No. I, I really like the styling from the front. It's, it's best really fit. It's golden, yeah. muscular. I, like yep. I seem to rather disagree with the rest of the team. <laughs> Glaring chrome plastic. Tiff didn't like the plastic on it. Come and have a look at this, look. Yep. Oh, look at that. <gasps> disco lights. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, disco lights. I know it's a bit novelty, but I quite like that. Those headlights are... Do we need those? Well, come and have a look at the back. All right. And when you get to the back, that's when the car really struck me as being a real good-looking car. These SUVs can sometimes be a bit too big. I like this. It's sort of seems for Porsche. It's a compact SUV. It's quite nice at the back. It's got a nice bit. Oh, of it's so really well styled. The front about and it. the rear are fantastic. The profile, I'm not so keen about. Well, I'll just, I'll just look, look at you straight then, because yeah. yeah, that's not good, is it? <laughs> Should we get in? Come on, get it and touch. The interior is a feast for your eyes. It's got a premium feel. It's got leather everywhere. What do you think? Isn't it luxurious? I didn't like the inside either. It's the same tacky plastic on the outside as coming. I don't, mind, the, I do you don't think mind it on the tacky? outside. I love the design. I wish it was proper metal. I just think it was a bit too busy. A lot of different effects in there. Mm, love clocks. One thing I did like though was the reclining back seats. No right. stole it off the Maybach. That nice is, little I, extra. I rarely see that. Now there is a really sexy thing about this car, other than its design. What is it? It's got a super trick suspension. Oh. Time for a quick test. To test the ride quality of the DS, we strapped a tank of water to its roof and tested it against a rival, the Audi Q5. Even though it's not badged as a Citroen, the DS has certainly tapped into the brand's heritage when it comes to finding innovative ways of ensuring a smooth ride. This time, it's got something called an active suspension scanning system. There's a little camera behind the rearview mirror and sensors everywhere, and it looks at the road and then adjusts yeah. the suspension accordingly. Obviously a very scientific test. I found it a little bit difficult not to be competitive. She's taking this really serious. I've got a cunning plan. <laughs> So this is a test of the cars. It's a highly scientific test, Victoria. Yeah, but I'm still... I've got to be competitive. <laughs> Heaven forbid I couldn't be beaten in any kind of car test by some sort of bloke who pots some balls. Do you know what I mean? I can't let Ronnie O'Sullivan spill less water than me. But his car might have a better ride. And looking at Vicky behind... Yeah. She's losing a lot of water, to be fair. Smooth over them bumps. Oh, well, they oh, speak oh, too oh, soon. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Do you know what? The ride quality is very good. It is smooth, it is. It, it is smooth, yeah. It's very supple. It absorbs all the bumps, which is great, actually. It's also very quiet. Just lost the load on that last bit. Uh, we got, we got, what we got? I think you've got what? Yes, the DS has lost more water, but Tiff has a theory on that. It rolled more, so it pitched the water, but it didn't vibrate through the seat, the bumps, the little shock shocks. This was all bumping yeah. up, but this is like I'm in a ripple road, because yeah. that was very smooth. Ah, so it seems the DS's clever suspension does make it more comfortable than the Audi. I think we'll call that a win then, Ronnie. Scores, please. DS's first real car in this market. Tough sector they're going for. I'm going to be... 
fair, I think, on the car. I'm going to give it a cheeky five. So if I'm to give this a score out of ten, I'm going to give it a six. I'm going to give the Citroen... <laughs> the DS7 six. I'll give the DS7 a four. So that rapid roundup gives the DS7 crossback a team test score of 21 out of 40. This time the team tested the Nissan Leaf. The Leaf is the best-selling electric car in the world, and this second-generation model claims to have an improved range of up to 168 miles fully charged. At £33,000, it's not cheap for a compact hatchback, but if you do decide to buy one, then the government will give you a £4,500 grant as an incentive to go green. Boys, the Nissan Leaf. It's just not my cup of tea. You know, I wouldn't be organised enough to have an electric car. I can't even remember what the first one looked like. Worse than this. Impressed, Ronnie? Um, not really, no. <laughs> I just don't like the shape of this either, though. It's a funny-looking thing. Why do they make them all look so just rubbish? It's not, it's not easy on the eye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blimey, Vix, what's all this? How far away is your plug got to be? Go, Jason, take it to the plug. Go, plug in my car, please. Where do I put this, then, Vix? Well, this is where the nose section comes in handy. Hey, I need Here we charger. go. Here's your flap. Oh, that's oh, what that there. little hole's yeah. for. That's nice. If you do take the plunge, Nissan will gift and install a car charger for free in your home, as long as you can plug the car in while it's parked off-road. Yeah, I mean, I can see it catching on with a lot of people. Is it leatherette or leather? Oh, I don't know. I think it's this is definitely carbon fibre S. <laughs> Did you know inside it's okay? It's all right. That's a nice little car, isn't it? Around town, yeah. doing a school yeah. run, isn't it? It's quite neat, it's quite funky. I've just turned it on, I can't hear anything. Do you know what? It's, for old people, it's all right, isn't it? <gasps> Let's ask them. It's only Tiff. joking. <laughs> I mean, I'm old now. Right, boys. Oh, God, I don't see room, that. Room. that. That whole thing of no noise and that move off is just very strange. Many people are put off electric cars by the limited distance you can travel on a full charge. Pootling around at 30 miles an hour is one thing, but motorway driving generally lowers the range significantly. So today we're testing that out. I'm fully charged and going to pretend we're on a motorway and drive it three times around Rockingham's oval track using any of the car's equipment that we need. All four of us in, aircon on, you know, a real-life kind of test. Is that how you drive normally? This is supposed to be a normal drive. And go... Well, she's mental, that's why. I was going a little bit quickly because, honestly, I really... I don't know how to drive slowly. I have a problem with it. I bet you I can get round here without even touching the brakes. Actually, that's not as alarming as it sounds because in e-pedal mode, every time I lift off the accelerator, the car slows automatically. Say you go to 80 accidentally and you've got to lift off back to 70, does it gently break? Well, that's 70, that's how yeah, it's you slow down. quite gently, it's yeah. It's quite gentle. So the e-pedal basically regenerates any braking that you have and puts that power back into the battery. I've still not touched the brakes. See, now that is odd. Nissan claims that when you switch to e-pedal mode, it'll increase your driving efficiency around town by about 90%. Are you a fan of regenerative braking, Ronnie? I think it's all right, yeah, I think it'd be all yeah. right around town. Yeah, I think you can just have in a break, you can just... It's, it makes it a bit more fun as well. So you need to brake this corner now, or is that just regen? I'm regen, regen, you regen. Yeah. Just regen. Yeah. yeah, that's quite a lot of braking, isn't it? Wow, look at that. Electric cars have great acceleration because the maximum amount of torque is available from zero MPH, unlike petrol or diesel cars, whose torque gradually builds with the engine revs. So, what's this leaf like? Lights are green. Go, go, go. Yeah, the acceleration's quite good, though, isn't it? Isn't it? Well, you've got 320 newton metres of torque. Very rolly, though, isn't it, in the back? It was heavy, you see. That's the point. You can't get away from the fact that electric cars are heavy still. Anyway, our three-lap test drive is up, so it's time to see how much life is left in the battery. So, what's the mileage now? I started with a range of 161 miles. I've travelled 10 miles, and it's now down to 123 mile range. What? We've lost 38 miles of range. Yeah, and only done 10, only done 10 miles. Yeah. Could have been struggling if we'd have been out on the open roads and been tearing around in it and wouldn't have been able to get to a station to charge the car up. That's just going to cause you stress, isn't it? <laughs> 
OK, we were simulating a thirsty motorway drive with four adults on board. Plus, we slung in an acceleration challenge. But in our test, the Leaf would only cover about a quarter of its advertised range. It's cheap to run, though. Nissan claims a full charge costs about £1.20. I mean, the Nissan Leaf isn't for me, but I guess as an electric car, it gets six. I really wish that this car was more dynamic to drive and to look at, but it's not. I'm going to give it a five. I do like that it's not a big car, it's a small car. I can imagine you can have some fun in it. So for that reason, I'm giving it a five. I don't like it. It's not it, it's just electric cars I don't like. So I'm going to give it, a, you know, a, a poor three. Which gives the Nissan Leaf a team test score of 19 out of 40. So this time, the team tested the Mercedes X-Class. And why are Mercedes building a pickup? Simply because more and more people are buying them and they want part of the action. There are two engines currently available, both diesel, and prices start at £34,000. But today, we're testing the top-of-the-range 250D 4MATIC power model, which will set you back around forty-two grand. So, this is the Mercedes pickup. A Mercedes pickup truck? This is the first time a premium manufacturer has entered into the pickup market, and I am all for it. I love pickup trucks. You can't have a three-pointed star on the front of a pickup. I liked it. I know Jason and Tiff didn't really like it. It's not even a Mercedes Benz. It's a Nissan, isn't it? Underneath. It, underneath the badge, it's basically in Nissan Navara. So this will be for people who need the extra space in the back and, and who've got to transport people or kids in. And do you think they would put in. stuff in the back of that, like people. Oh, sand sure. and cement? And yes. Yeah, of course. In this. Tiff and Jason don't know what they're talking about. It's a manual car. But the problem is, car. other people can pick up your goods you've got in the back, it's no, all it's open. The, it's all, you have special covers over the top. It's got, you know, in the back bit, the pickup bit, there's this cover thing, which is a bit of a fiddle to open. Who uses a key nowadays? There you go. There you go. I'm not getting in the back, I'm not getting in the back. Once you get inside, you kind of feel the luxury. So for me, a massive plus point was the interior. What do they call that? Brushed aluminium. Brushed it's aluminium. More the, um, sport, that's a sporty type, isn't it? Yeah. It is murkish in the front. I mean, it's, it's still an off-roady, pick-up-y type thing. My missus would like it. Would yeah. she? Yeah, yes. she would. Yeah, she likes it. She likes a G-Wagon. No. She likes all these pick-up type trucks. I sometimes get a bit fed up of seeing all these big Range Rovers and cars like that, so I would definitely go for the Mercedes all day long. Check, check this out. It won't open. I've tried opening it. Technology, Whoa. technology, technology. The best part about the Mercedes was driving it off-road. Mercedes claim the X-Class is comfortable enough for families around town, but rugged enough for off-road work. So that's what we tested. Tiff was at the helm. We'll just put a bit of lock on and put a bit of power Yay. on. Tiff did some Tiff stuff. Oh, 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 oh she donuts. Oh, a bit of donuts, even. donuts yeah. It does donuts. So what more do you want? What a super car to have. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's a bit of there. Getting oh. a bit dusty here. It was impressive. Yeah, I'm not stopping, Vic. It's now called Suicide Slope. You love to stay on board. We're going up, we're going up. He took one look at some steep slope and started telling Ronnie about what could go wrong, like he could roll over and roll down the hill and stuff. I'm stuck, Vic. I'm stuck. Oh, I can't go forwards or backwards, Vic. Are you all right? I'm stuck. Don't oh, do this to I me. Can't... Oh, I don't know. It could be a cliff the other <laughs> side. I'm not sure. I don't She's showing signs oh, of hyperventilation. I'm not sure what's the other side. At that point, I was like, no. I've, I've done enough off roading with Tiff at the wheel. I'm out. No, no, she's on. She's gone. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it again. I had confidence in Tiff's driving ability, and he managed to kind of get it to the top. It's just talk, it's all about, I mean, low, this is how you climb, you see. Easy. Once I saw that Tiff wasn't going to roll the car today, I got back in it, and then we went and did some other off-roading, and it was unbelievably competent. Now that's much better, eh? It was good fun. <laughs> I'm a Mercedes. You're not. You're a Nissan. The three-pointed star deserves three points. A seven. Smack in the middle, five. I'm going to give the X-Class seven and a half. Which gives the Mercedes X-Class a team test score of 22 and a half. Today, we tested the Dacia Duster. 
Duster is the cheapest car in its class, with prices starting at just nine grand. There is a four-wheel drive model, but we're testing the mid-range two-wheel drive version. Boys, this is the Dacia, as in Thatcher, Duster. Don't like it. It's the worst car I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I know it's a cheap car and it's supposed to be aimed at the cheap market, but I still think they could have done a better job making it look a little bit nicer. I think it just looks like a nice functional car. Yeah. It's a mode of transport, isn't it's it? It's just what rugged it is. and ready. This is a good grassroots motor, so yeah, happy to see it here. Come on then. Come see. <laughs> so new to the Dacia Duster range. Armrest on the driver's seat. Now that's an upgrade. Oh, yeah. Obviously, you're not going to have really plush carpets and loads of leather anywhere. You won't get that for the money. But the plastics in there are perfectly fine and it's an, a robust interior. Space in the back is all right? Yeah, yeah that's actually quite comfortable. Right. Can I draw you... your attention to something amazing that, that probably Jason's never seen before? Ronnie, to your right hand side, yeah. there is a place for you to put your rear seat belt. What? Pull your I'll rear seat belt out. Look at that. That is so simple. Why has no one else done that? Yeah, this is. is all about inside this car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed first impressions from us, but the Dacia is aimed at families who want a budget runaround. So let's see if we can find some of the people who might actually buy it. Off to the supermarket. So you're feeling the Dacia love at the minute, anyone? Uh, do you know what? I was expecting to be noisier and a bit more agricultural and tinny yeah. than it is. It's OK, is it? Yeah. What's it like to drive? It's pleasantly OK. I would like a bit more power, so I'd look forward to the petrol turbo engine that's coming in 2019. I always want more power, though. Well, Steering wheel's quite light. Do you, know what they, do you know what the most popular ice cream is? Vanilla. That's all right, isn't it? What a brilliant analogy. I think it's slightly more than vanilla. I think there's a little bit of raspberry sauce in there. Ooh! It's a well-equipped, comfortable car. It does make you think, perhaps we're all getting slightly ripped off by the other manufacturers. I think the best thing about this car is the name, Duster. Duster. The Duster. I'm taking Duster out. <laughs> oh, watch out, Vix, there's a speed bump there. Oh, don't worry, we're in some sort of, you know, crossover SUV. I can get over this. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, it's all right. We took it down to the local supermarket to find out what people thought. And what car do you drive? Tucson. The two ah, okay, you got Tucson, okay. Which I chose over it. Ah, so you're familiar with the yes. Dacia? Okay. But were you not tempted with the price? I'm a bit of a car snob. Okay. How much do you reckon a car like this would cost you? Twenty six thousand. So would your jaw hit the floor when I told you you could get this very car in front of you for a little bit more than thirteen thousand pounds, brand new. Look, plenty of space. Get the grandkids in there. Yep. A bit of shopping. Yep. I never thought I would see Ronnie becoming a car salesman. It was like something took the man over. Two, oh, yeah. two suitcases in there. Yep. Plenty, eh? Yeah, very nice. He was the one that liked it least. And then he was there bigging it up. Very Next nice. time we go looking for a car, Duster. <laughs> So the Duster managed to win over some people by the end of the day. But what will the team score it? I'm going to give the Dacia Duster 8 out of 10. Ooh. There were two things I liked about the Duster, and that was the name, Duster, and the price tag. So I'm going to give it a generous 3. It does exactly what it says it's going to do, so I'm going to give it a very credible 7 out of 10. The Dacia Duster scores a healthy 7. Which gives the Dacia Duster a team test score of 25 out of 40. Today, we tested the Alpine A110. But before looking at the new car, I reckon the best way of assessing Renault's revival of the Alpine brand was to go back to where it all began, the original A110. What do you reckon? I think that is utterly charming. Lovely, isn't it? But enough about you. <laughs> Jason arrived in an old car. It was also a very tiny, weeny car. In fact, this particular A110 is knocking on for 60 years old. 1961, this was originally launched. Light and agile, that's what this car was all about. 92 horsepower, that's all it had. I mean, that's unbelievable, isn't it? This car was a successful car. You know, in its day, this thing was amazing. You know, it won the Monte Carlo Rally in 71, but importantly, won the World Rally Championships in 73. Yeah. So, successful. It's just oozing character out of every little orifice. 
fantastic to see a car like that in the flesh. They say the best things come in little packages, and that's true, as long as you don't have to sit in the little package. You forget over the years just how small classic sports cars were. I now know what sardines feel like. Once jammed in, though, Vicky and Jimmy decided to go for a spin, and they weren't disappointed. This handles really well. I'm smiling. You are in a little bit of magic. This has got theatre. Yes. So there's the benchmark. Good-looking, fast, agile and charismatic. That's what the new model's got to live up to. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Oh, hello, hello. Hey. And then the new one arrived. <laughs> wow, look at that. This is what Renault hope will get them a chunk of the lucrative two-seater sports car market, the new Alpine A110. At 1,103 kilograms, it's 300 kilos more than the old car. However, its mid-mounted engine delivers 252 horsepower, which means its power-to-weight ratio is double that of the classic machine. Oh, that's now, right, now you've stepped it up. Oh, I like this. I think Alpine has been very clever in making the car have similar design features. It's a Joy good take on that, isn't it? It's a beautiful car to look at. You know, I'm not sure about the front end. It's just not got the same drama as the old car. It looks a bit Japanese. I mean, Toyota-y. Jimmy might have had reservations about the styling, but there was one thing we all agreed on, interior space. Try that for size. Thank you so much. At least with the modern one, you've got your legs dead straight. Mm -hmm. I think this is fantastic in here, and I really like these piano-type keys. It was comfortable, it was relatively well finished. And there's going to be another advantage of owning this car, rarity. Do you know what, I, this is the first one I've ever seen. I've never seen any on the road, so it's rare as hen's yeah. teeth, and yeah. that's a cool thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. <laughs> So far, most of us like the new car's styling and extra space, but it's on the move that it's going to be really judged. So I decided to take Ronnie for a spin to see what he thought. Oh. Well, it's the first time that Ronnie's sat with me. Oh. <laughs> and I'm not sure he prepared himself well, actually. Oh. Oh. He made some weird inner noises. Oh. <laughs> I think they were involuntary. Oh, yeah, she moves around a bit, which is nice. I don't know, this car's staying on the road. What are you doing with it? Really, really impressive it. Great handling, especially when Jason's driving it. Mental, look at that, look. Wow. They've designed it to have a really low centre of gravity, which then makes it handle a bit better. It was great fun to drive. The chassis was really well balanced. Do you know what? I'm impressed with the steering. It's pinpoint accurate. Good grip, good composure. Well, oh, it's nicely balanced. Made a nice noise. That's good, isn't it? That pop from the exhaust really sold it to me. So, after we'd all had a go in the new A110, it was time for the scores. Because the Alpine looks so good, drives well, great performance, nice and comfortable, I'm going to give it a seven. I'm going to give it a peachy seven. I'm going to give the Alpine A110 seven out of ten. I'm going to give the new Alpine six out of ten, because for me, it's a near miss. Which gives the all-new Alpine A110 a team test score of 27 out of 40. <laughs> Today, the team tested the Vauxhall Insignia GSI Sports Tourer. This insignia is the first Vauxhall to wear their sporty GSI badge since 2005. Hatchback and estate versions are available and two engine types, a 255 horsepower petrol or, the model we're testing, a 210 horsepower diesel. It's undoubtedly fine on a motorway, but to test out the car's performance image, we brought it to the track. Gentlemen, I bring you the Vauxhall Insignia GSI Sports Tourer, or a state car. Hey, it's not a bad thing. Joe, yeah, it's a good-looking car, I think. And it was nothing special, rather big to me. Big. Big. Doesn't it... look big. Yeah, it's really big. It looks like someone's crashed into the side of it, I'm going to be honest with you. It's all messed up. 
What is that? It looks like a gouge. I quite liked, actually, the sculpted line down the side of it. Just listen. Just listen to this. Oh, you're a, you're a plastic... It's a horrid. OK, there's some itchy plastics inside, but apart from that, it's actually a pretty good car. It's not Michelin star grub, it's just a pizza. And pizzas are good. I like pizzas. It seems Jimmy didn't like the insignia's general styling, but the main thing we were here to comment on was the supposed sportiness of this particular GSI model. You get um, lowered stiffened suspension and skirts. Ah, yeah, it's been round the Nurburgring 12 seconds faster than the old one. However, that's the petrol version. We had the oil burner. It's just difficult to get excited about a diesel estate car. I have found something in the back that I like, and we're all looking in the wrong place because it's there. Oh, well, first aid kit. What do you think then, Jason? I think the seats are a bit hard. What did I like about this car? I like the seats. They look nice. They look yeah. good from the back. They look GSIE. I like the seats. Only automatic. That's a shame, isn't it? This is the first Vauxhall to have an eight-speed box. An eight-speed gearbox is strapped to a two-litre... I'm still not impressed. Two-litre diesel in a GSI. It just doesn't do what GSI says it does. Shall we go for a drive? He's stuff. got that look on his face. Look. Let's strap him. Yeah. When we went out for a little drive, the whole team on board, the disappointment began. Are you feeling like a GSI? No, cos I'm feeling like a taxi driver. The gearbox is a little bit indecisive. It doesn't really know what it wants to do. It doesn't feel sporty. It doesn't quite feel slick enough. It feels quite soft, even though this is supposed it to be... It feels very soft. But, as always, you know, there was a beast within Tiff. Sport, sport. dear, sport. Let's have sport. I mean, he just simply cannot drive a car sensibly. Is he ESC off? Here we go. We've got, got any, build up we got any Valium. It was only a matter of time before we were going the wrong way. Look on his face again. <laughs> it does trip you warn me about that, though. Hey, do you think it's ever going to be driven in this style, this thing? The problem is, while the GSI will let you drift a bit, it won't let you drift a lot. With a safe torque vectoring four-wheel drive system, as soon as it's a bit sideways, the power goes to the front wheels, it goes all straight again. Torque vectoring is a system that varies the amount of torque to each wheel in order to optimise grip. It's not really GSI, is it, really? Then it just dies. It grabs, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Well, it needs, it needs another 100 horsepower, doesn't it? Whoa! Yes! No! no, 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 no Correct no, no, too fast, doesn't it? Yeah. You can't hold it. So, apart from Jimmy, who hated almost everything, the team had generally agreed that the Insignia GSI was a decent estate, but a disappointing sports car. So, what are the scores? It can't live up to the GSI standard. So, I'm sorry, because of that. It's a three from me. I'm sorry, Vauxhall, but your new GSI just gets a feeble four. If this wasn't the GSI, I would give it seven. But because it's the GSI and it's not quite right, I'm going to give it that. In middle of the road, number five. Which gives the Vauxhall Insignia GSI a team test score of 18 out of 40. <laughs> So today, the team tested the Ford Fiesta ST. The last Fiesta ST, which came out in 2012, was highly acclaimed for its handling. So can the latest one match up or possibly be even better? Prices start at £19,245, but we're driving the mid-spec ST2 version, which costs a grand more. So, Ford Fiesta ST! It wasn't quite as exciting to look at as I hoped for. This has gone quite mature. It's a clean, well-appointed, not too leery looking car. I, I this think it's a bit of class. Because they've lost a cylinder. What? Yeah. Now three cylinders. Oh, this is the three cylinder, I forgot, yeah. yeah. But not only does it only have three cylinders, but it'll actually run on two. Yes, you heard that correctly. When the car is being driven on a light throttle, it will actually run on two cylinders, further improving fuel consumption. But it's the same power as the four-cylinder outgoing model. Problem with downsizing engines is sometimes you take out the excitement in the quest for economy. Well, the great thing about this is if this car is as much fun as the last car and it does, like, ten more MPG... Yeah. ..happy days, Rock and right? Normally, when you're sat in the back of a car that size that's three-door and you're six-foot-three, it's an issue. 
Th even three. What's doors. it like in there? Oh, hot. It's, it's all getting right. hot in here. I've got oh! Some there. Have you got enough room? Yeah, I got an inch wow. before my knee touches anything. Tiff's got loads. This car really has got some quality little touches. The chalk striping, just little things. It all comes together. Race track use only. There you go. Quite good, eh? The only problem sitting in the back was Jason was driving. He immediately, you saw his eyes widen, he was like, I know this is going to be an exciting car. Oh, did you feel the rear oh, yeah. just having a little bit of a... It's got engineered in. How does the steer oversteer? It's got a good feel. The steering is nicely weighted, the driving position's good, the seats hug you well. We did soon find a small problem with the Fiesta. None of us have got oh, grab handles. Grab None of us. Corners, me and Johnny. I want to be out the back now. What are you getting out for? We've got no doors. There's no escape hatches in the back. I'd had enough. With the loose dead weight thrown out, I could really show Jimmy what the car could do. It's got some get up and go. It's a bit go kart like. And that's what you want in a fun little hot hatch. Great fun. I can't believe it's a 1500cc engine. It's going like something with a lot more of an engine. It's got the power when you need it. It's got the economy when you need it. This thing works. If a sporty little car like this is going to be sporty, you should be able to push it to a limit of discomfort. That's what I always think. So you can't push something that far, then it's a bit mediocre. All the way, all the way, all the way. I found that out. What was that? Hey, shut your face. Get out of the car if you, you're not going to vomit, are you? I just, uh... Is that a sink perp? Re-swallow some Jaffa cake. Oh. oh! So the chuckable little Fiesta had proved chuckable in other ways. Scores, please. The little Fiesta ST didn't disappoint. It gets a nine. So I'm giving it a nine. Well done, Ford. I'm going to give it this. 8.5. I loved it, and I'm going to give it an 8. Which gives the Fiesta ST a team test score of 34.5 out of 40, the highest in the series so far. The car that the team tested today was a Volvo V60 D4. Volvo is renowned for producing cars that are not only safe, but also comfortable and well-made. However, does their new V60 estate now have the style and luxury to compete with premium rivals like BMW's 3 Series and Mercedes C-Class? Prices start at 32 grand, but we have the mid-spec D4 Momentum Pro. Volvo V60 D4. It's a classy piece of work. It's a big thing, isn't it? Big unit. They're all, they're all getting big. First impression was it just wasn't that exciting to look at for me. A solid and safe, but does that wow you? I'd probably spec it in a slightly more interesting colour. This is just sensible styling. Sensible. Well, it's like it's like Scandinavian furniture. I like the styling. Just it's minimalistic. Quietly and... cool. Look at the Thor's hammer headlights. We've seen them in the, the XC90. What, 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 the what, the Thor's what? hammer headlights. That's what on earth are you talking about? That is about? the hammer of Thor. Oh, Thor! Oh, I, see. I thought you said Thor. It says Volvo in all of the headlights. It's got some nice little touches. Oh, your neighbour's going to see that when they open the curtains, aren't they? I mean, Tiff was particularly grumpy today, I have to say. Nice little it, touches. Your neighbour is going to be jealous that you're driving a quality bit of kit. Volvo. Particularly grumpy. It's supposed to have class-leading boot space. I got in the boot and we found all sorts of switches to make seats go forward. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, 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 oh. That was quite exciting inside. Hold on, hold on, hold on. There is only one thing that really smacked me around the chops that I didn't like about this Volvo, and that's in the boot. What on earth is that for? There's an extra flap that comes up if you've only got a little bit of shopping. Do you know what? That's a good idea, isn't it's it? It's a really good idea. They've not put carpet on the underside. Come on, Volvo, it's all about the detail. You know that, I don't need to tell you that. Oh, it's a festival of soft to the touch leather in here. <laughs> oh. Love the, the styling of the interior, that got me more excited. I love that centre console. I like the infographics and the way it all works. 
just a symphony of technology. A rimless mirror. Oh, yeah. Just, Doesn't that look yeah. nice? It's a classy feel. The materials are nice inside. And the seat's so damn comfortable, so adjustable. It's just textbook, well-appointed, safe Volvo. It's exactly what they say they're going to do, done exactly how they say they're going to do it. So, in terms of styling, quality and finish, the V60 was certainly shaping up as a premium family estate. But would it be as pleasing to drive on the open road, where it's designed to ferry families in comfort? When we took it out on the road, I really liked it. You can tell this is sort of calibrated for your motorway munching miles. In fact, the V60 seems to transport you to another world of calmness and serenity. It's graceful. That's a nice word. Eight-speed automatic, no paddles, just stick it in D and cruise, chat. Look at those nice flowers on the right. Ooh, very nice indeed. Flowers. The ambiance of the car is good. I'm buying into the Scandinavian tranquility. But it appeared to be a drive of two halves. Sitting in the back with Jason, after a while, we both started to think, oh, this ride quality isn't very good. Jiggly. Jarring. Because the front doesn't feel that. At the front, I found that it was kind of quite soft and a bit lollopy. I still think it rides firm in the back. Do you? Yeah. 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 I was a bit disappointed, actually. You could feel everything in the road. And uh, I had a bit of a sore, stiff back, and so did Tiff, actually. So I think there was a bit of uh, disagreement over whether it was deemed to be comfortable enough for yeah. a family oriented Volvo. It does create a nice, comfy, sort yeah. of huggy space. Huggy space, love that. So we generally agreed that this new Volvo is classy, well-equipped and well-made, though it seems that the front passengers enjoyed a more restful ride than those in the rear. On to the scores. This isn't the most exciting car, but what it is is extremely well executed. So for that, I'm going to give it a six. Nice experience, nice to be in. You'd be really happy in a long drive. I like it. I'm going to score it a seven. Nothing really to excite, but nothing really to criticise. Volvo V60 gets six. It is handsome, it is practical, and, crucially for me, it's unpretentious. I give it that, which is an eight. Which gives the Volvo V60 a team test score of 27 out of 40. Thank <laughs> you.